Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker, and I am an author, speaker, and the professor of Holy Land Studies at the Israel Bible Center. I am passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. And I love having geeky conversations with people about new things. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members and guests at IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. These are some of my favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. I am once again joined by Dr. Yeshaya Gruber, who is the Professor of Jewish History and Culture at Israel Bible Center, along with being a very much appreciated host of the Roundtable Talks. We are in the middle of talking about his course, Kabbalah and the Bible, Part 1. We tried our best to define the undefinable in last week's episode, and we talked about Kabbalistic reading of Israel's creation narratives, as well as in the Gospel of John. If you missed that conversation about Logos and the creation narratives, you may want to pause on this episode and go back and listen to last week's episode. This week, we start with another New Testament text that Dr. Gruber placed in that Jewish mysticism category, and that is the writings of Paul. So how does mystical language show up in the epistles? Oh, and we have to get to the feminine divine. But that comes in a moment. For now, lean in and enjoy the conversation. There are so many places in Paul that really are <laughs> mystical in their nature. If you view it as trying to get to something beyond the t uh, tangible, beyond the literal, I'll just run through a few as I find them in my class notes and people can look uh, in the class for more. But the first one that I see here is 1 Corinthians 15, and it's talking about the first Adam and the second Adam, one of earth and one from heaven. And this is also an idea that we find in a lot of Kabbalistic literature. It's talking about a kind of Adam before the Adam. It's not exactly the same, but we compare those ideas. We talk about, you know, what does this mean? Well, this is a also a kind of, I don't want to always say metaphor, because also some people will misunderstand the idea of metaphor to mean it's not real. But it's not just dealing with like genealogy. It's dealing with metaphysical concepts. The, the first Adam and the second Adam represent something more than just like one person who was born and one person, another person who was born. It's a, it's a metaphysical concept. So that's a similarity. I have a few passages compiled in the course notes where 1 Corinthians 15, again, he says, now I say this, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable, Behold, I'm telling you a mystery or a secret. So as soon as he says mystery, that puts it in the realm of mysticism. It's not something that you can touch and feel and prove. It's more more reflective and maybe revelatory and something you have to just meditate on and consider what's mysterious about it. But note also that what mystery is he talking about here? He's talking about something that's perishable or corrupt and imperishable or incorrupt, which is a very, very similar type of dichotomy to the idea of finite and infinite that forms a lot of the basis for mystical reflection. You know, how can infinite hold, how can finite hold the infinite or how can the imperishable, sorry, how can the perishable hold the imperishable? It's the same type of reflection. And then he explicitly says this is a mystery. In Colossians 1, the mystery which was hidden from past ages but is now revealed to his holy ones. So mystical thought is saying, well, there are mysteries in, in, in our world, in our understanding of ourselves, in our understanding of God. That's the basic idea. There are mysteries. So we can't fully explain them. We can't fully define them, but we can hint at them. And Paul does that over and over, and he claims that he has this kind of mystical insight into things. He claims that there's a way to sometimes access it or partly see it. Um, you know, he uses a lot of language like that also. We see through a glass dimly. You know, we don't see the full reality. That's mystical language. It's a bit ineffable. You can't say it exactly. He talks about visions that are similar to other apocalyptic visions, 
of the time, you know, being caught up into the third heaven and things like that, and not being able to fully explain what it is. He says in Colossians 2 that he wants to move toward a true knowledge of God's mystery. So that's, again, this is mystical language. If it, were, if it wasn't mysticism, he wouldn't need to say that it's a mystery. He could just tell you what it is, like theology does today. You know, <laughs> that's the difference between mysticism and theology. Theology tells you what it is. It defines it for you. It says, this is the way things are. And mystics say, that that doesn't make sense. You know, there's there's a mystery here. There's something that's not wor- right. It's, wor- you know, you're, you've come up with a formula, but it doesn't quite fit. Um, for some reason, it never quite fits. And th- that's what Paul is saying here, too. You know, there's a mystery and there's the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. Why are they hidden? Why can't you just tell us what they are? So that's what I mean when I talk about Paul being mystical. You mentioned in the course that there is an aspect of Kabbalistic literature that deals with the feminine divine. And I would love to hear more about that. And it's, you know, different uh, feminist literature that I've read, especially when we, if we go back to creation, creation narratives, and we have the spirit of God, the Ruach, and people point to the feminine of the Ruach. But I'd, I'd just be curious, how does this concept of a feminine divine show up? Yeah, well, you know, um, <laughs> it's a, in some ways a very apropos question today, as there's a lot of discussion, uh, if you will, of gender issues and things like that coming to the fore all around us in our societies. And I think that there's also a lot of confusion about these issues. And part of the confusion stems from not understanding that these issues have been discussed from time immemorial. Yes. You know, it's it's maybe harder in English because English today, modern English doesn't have gender. But gender is really a linguistic concept. And so in many languages, words have gender. They're either feminine or masculine. And this can be very significant or not at all significant depending on how you analyze the language. You know, interestingly, C.S. Lewis, uh, the Christian writer, had quite a lot to say about this. He was an expert on language. That was really his field, language and literature. And he has some reflections that he throws into his novels and other books about the nature of masculine and feminine and whether it connects at all or not to male and female, which is a different concept. But the Kabbalists were very much into these things, and it wasn't like they had to reflect so much on it, it was uh, on the basic idea of masculine and feminine, it was given to them in the language because Hebrew does have gender. So you find some very, very interesting things when you read the basic Hebrew text and it's just given to you as this masculine and this feminine. And probably when you refer to the feminine presence, you're referring to the Shekhinah, which is the which is a word that's used for God, for the presence of God, and it's a feminine word. So that's at like many concepts in both the Bible and in Kabbalistic literature, it's personified in a lot of the discussion. So like chokhmah, wisdom, is also feminine and is also personified in both Jewish and Greek thought, often comes to be personified, um, Sophia in Greek. And so um, what you make of these genders in the language is somewhat a matter of interpretation. But when it comes to the divine, I think the Jewish mystics never doubted that, of course, there's a feminine aspect to the divine. How could it not be? Because, I mean, even you don't even have to get into mysticism for this. In Genesis, might be 128 or 126 or something like that, it says that, as you alluded to before, that humans are created in the image of the divine, male and female. Zahar and Keva. So how can humans be created in the image of the divine, whatever that means, uh, male and female, if there's not some sort of male and female in the divine, or at least masculine and feminine. And so the Kabbalists tend to believe that the language, the Hebrew language in particular, is reflecting these realities about the divine. So when we read about Torah, for example, teaching or instruction, that's feminine, that there is really something feminine about it, that there's, they're kind of essentialist, I guess, in that way. There's, it's not just an arbitrary linguistic designation, but there really is something feminine there. There really is something feminine in the Shekhinah 
in the presence of God. En sof, I guess you could say, is masculine. You know, mishpat, judgment, is masculine. So there, there are these two sides, these concepts. And I think that it fits into a broader template, if you will, of how the ancient world, how people in the ancient world thought about reality. Even if you look at all the Hellenistic gods and goddesses, they are, on the one hand, religious figures, pantheon of religious beings that they believe to be divine. But on the other hand, they're concepts like victory and love and freedom. You know, that all the gods are actually concepts also in Greek. So they're personifying those concepts, so to speak, and they see them as either masculine or feminine, male or female. And the Hebrew language has something similar without making these concepts into gods, but with regard to all of, the, all of these things that come from God, like light and wisdom and, and the divine presence and, um, and so forth. So that what they're, what they're saying or what they're experiencing or trying to express is that our world that comes solely from the divine, from that ray of light that came from the Ein Sof, it has all of these things all around us that are both masculine, you know, some are masculine, some are feminine, and that not it's not only our perception, but that's the nature of the world we live in. That's the nature of our experience with the divine. It, it should affect our understanding. There are so many more interesting parts of the course that you can explore when you enroll in the course. And there are more interesting aspects of Kabbalah that Dr. Gruber was not able to fit in part one of his course, Kabbalah and the Bible. When I asked Dr. Gruber what is coming in part two, he pointed to a huge collection of books that were behind him on the bookshelf to demonstrate how expansive the nature of this topic is. So there's no end to what could be discussed, really. Uh, we're trying to bring out a few very important concepts and meditations that relate specifically to biblical texts. But yes, I'm working on part two, and uh, it's hard. the hardest part is deciding what to include. But I do want to include more of the meditations on male and female, on love and even eros as they're interpreted in Jewish mystical thought. You know, I recently did a roundtable talk with Adele Berlin, who's a well-known uh, Jewish biblical scholar, and she has a new commentary coming out on the Song of Songs. Now, the Song of Songs has often been interpreted in Jewish and Christian tradition as a kind of allegory of love, not just between a man and a woman, but between God and Israel, or God and some other entity of humans. Um, she doesn't accept that interpretation as being original, but of course there are many, many interpretations, and certainly you could say within Kabbalistic literature they took this, this kind of idea and ran with it, you know, made lots of analogies about love and what it means, you know, for the broader dimensions. So I want to highlight how the, how Jewish mysticism has tried to explain that whatever's going on in our world, there's also like, oh, it's the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. It's the 10% that you see, but there's 90% that you don't see. That's the mystery they're trying to point to. The same thing with the mitzvot, the commandments, whatever God tells us to do in the Torah, the feminine instruction. You know, there's, there's an action, but then there's something that's going on in the broader metaphysical world. So I want to highlight that, you know, how they make these connections. And, uh, of course, people will have heard about the significance of specific numbers and specific letters and interpreting those. Um, so we'll look at that. And the interesting thing, again, is in Hebrew, it's the same. You know, the letters are used as numbers. So you're not really talking about two different things exactly. You're kind of talking about the same thing in a different way. And for some reason, you know, for 2,000 years, this has been a key element of what's now identified as Jewish mystical literature. The, the earliest sources are already talking about how the letters themselves are mystical and, you know, have all this hidden meaning and so forth. We, when we started, you were talking about not, Kabbalistic literature is not necessarily something that you have done a lot of study on previously. Um, what is it that you have gained and how has it captured your attention after doing all of the study and you've put together this course and are putting together part two? Is it changing your mind or are you understanding it in a new way? 
Well, I think the old adage is a good one, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Just because you hear one model of Kabbalah, don't assume that's what it is. And uh, that's kind of what I learned, I think, delving into it. I also learned on a more personal level, I guess, that I'm a mystic. You know, I didn't think of myself as a mystic. But the way that I think about the world and the way that I think about the divine and creation is mystical because I don't believe it can be all defined. I don't think it's all tangible. I think there's something that cannot fully be expressed in our language, in our experience. And so we have to be humble before that, if you will, greater reality, the, the truth with a capital T. We don't possess it. We, we, can't, we can't quantify it. And I think that um, sometimes that's missing in the religious experience of people from all sorts of traditions, whatever religion, whatever denomination, I think that's often missing, that over time, however it started, a particular religious group tries to sort of define everything and give you the way things are. And what Jewish mysticism is saying is, come with a little bit more of an open mind and reflect honestly and humbly within yourself realizing that basically we, we don't know and or we can't express all of what's reality, but we are getting these hints. Again, I think of Paul because he is so much along this line of thinking. And he, he says in Athens, you know, that we have to um, grope about like in a dark room almost for the divine, you know, if perhaps we might reach something. So mysticism is saying we don't have all the answers. Now, for some people, that's a controversial statement, but if you forget about any sort of dogma or ideology or what you're supposed to know, I don't understand how that can be controversial, you know, in this, in this life. How can, how can anyone argue with that? And that's basically the idea of mysticism, to say we don't have all the answers and to stick with that, to not say, aha, but I've now found the answers, A, B, C, D, E, and so forth. Um, but to persistently learn and seek to draw closer to the truth while continuously recognizing that it will be mysterious and ineffable and beyond our grasp to some extent. And because I selfishly wanted to end with a biblical passage that expresses mysticism, we go to Ecclesiastes. I love a good Ecclesiastes quote. And I've been in an Ecclesiastes mood lately, and this concept is a beautiful way to end a discussion on Kabbalah. So there's one passage from Kohelet, or Ecclesiastes, which is just f so fascinating to think about in terms of the mystical approach. And you, you mentioned Ecclesiastes at the beginning of our discussion. And in, in Hebrew it says, Gam et haolam natan belibam. So it's, it's something like, and also the olam, what is the olam? Well, it could be the universe, it could be an age, space-time, has a, a temporal and a spatial dimension. So also this universe he has placed in their hearts. But then it goes on to say, it, it's a convoluted expression, but it's something like without them being able to really understand what God has done. And that's... Um, for anyone who wants to look it up, Ecclesiastes 3.11. I talk more about this in the course. I go through the, the language there. but it, So it's basically this idea that God has placed in us this mystery of our existence and of our universe. And we try to search it out. And we, we search out some things, but we're not fully able to comprehend what it is that God has done, what it is that is going on. We can feel it. We can swim in it. We can experience some of it, um, but it remains a kind of mystery. And that's the declaration, I guess, on which Kabbalistic thought is based. And now, I said I was a mystic. I don't call myself a Kabbalist. I think, you know, sometimes Kabbalistic thought may go too far, like any sort of uh, ideological or religious thought in claiming well, we can then define these inexpressible, indefinable things, and people then believe it almost like it's a dogma and so forth. But that principle, I think, is the key thing uh, to keep in mind, that 
the heavens are higher than the earth. You know, God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts, like it says in um, Isaiah or in Jeremiah, you know, the word of God is like a fire inside me that can't be contained. It's it's beyond us. We have to just have that humility if we're going to approach the divine to recognize that there's something so far beyond ourselves that we can't take this sometimes arrogant view of saying, well, I've figured it out and I've defined it. I think that idea of being humble before the divine and being curious and recognize that you're never going to reach the boundary because it's not containable is something I think I sit in that. I guess maybe I'm a mystic too. <laughs> I, <laughs> I find that to be a really Put interesting that in. place to sit. I got to you sit. to uh, admit that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, I find that to be a, a wonderfully curious place to sit. And I guess I don't need the certainty. I want the curiosity of like of all things. Wow, what a beautiful way of putting it. If you love conversations like this and don't mind learning to sit in the curiosity of all things, join us at IBC, where you have access to so many amazing courses that dig into the details of culture and interpretation. You can even earn credit towards Israel Bible Center Certificate Program in Jewish Context and Culture. And then once you do that, you can dive right into Dr. Gruber's course on Kabbalah and the Bible. Thank you to Jeremy McDonald from Mason Jar Music for doing a really fantastic job editing, mixing, and adding in all the good music. And thank you for hanging out with me and being curious about all things Bible-related.